On the peaceful night of December 24, 1945, the Sauter family was struck by tragedy when their home suddenly erupted in flames. George and Jenny Sauter, along with four of their children, managed to escape the inferno. However, five of their children vanished into the night, leaving behind a mystery that would perplex investigators, captivate the nation, and torment the Sauter family for generations. What followed was not just a quest for survival, but a relentless pursuit of answers in a case filled with more questions than answers. Welcome to As Told by Bells, where mysteries unfold, the bizarre becomes reality, and strange stories come to life. I'm Bells, your guide into the world of the unexplained. Every Sunday, we'll delve into unsolved mysteries that continue to baffle and tell so bizarre you won't believe they actually happened. To stay in the loop with every captivating story, make sure to hit that subscribe button, drop a like, and ring that notification bell. Trust me, you don't want to miss a single episode of these extraordinary stories we're about to unravel. Now let the storytelling begin. The Sauter family's Christmas Eve in 1945 was set to be a memorable one, with the household bustling in preparation for the festive night. George and Jenny Sauter, along with nine of their children, John, Marion, George Jr., Maurice, Martha, Louis, Jenny, Betty, and Sylvia, Ages ranged from 2 to 23 years old, had settled in Fayetteville, West Virginia, building a life filled with hard work and close family ties. The second oldest son, Joe, who was 21, had left home to serve in the military during World War II. But as they tucked their children into bed that night, they were unaware that it would be the last time their family would be together under one roof. Marion, the eldest daughter, had worked at a dime store in the heart of Fayetteville. She bought new toys as gifts for three of her younger sisters, Betty, Jenny, and Martha. The smaller kids asked their mother if they could stay up later than their typical bedtime since they were so excited, and she said yes. It was 10 p.m., so she told them they could stay up a little later as long as Maurice and Louis, the two oldest boys who were still awake, fed the chickens, and put the cows in before turning in for the night. John and George Jr., the two eldest boys, had already fallen asleep after working with their father during the day. She took two-year-old Sylvia upstairs with her after reminding the kids of the last few tasks she wanted them to finish, and she went to bed. It was 12.30 a.m. when the phone rang. After waking up, Jenny walked downstairs to answer it. There was laughter and clinking glasses in the background as the caller, a lady whose voice she did not recognize, asked for a name she did not know. Jenny told the caller that she had the wrong number and hung up. It was then that she noticed that the kids had neither drawn the curtains nor turned off the lights, two things they always did when they stayed up later than their parents. Jenny figured the other kids who stayed up later had gone back up to the attic to sleep since Marion had fallen asleep on the living room couch. She closed the curtains, turned out the lights, and went back to bed. At one in the morning, Jenny was woken by the sound of something striking the roof on the house with a loud bang and then a rolling noise. After hearing nothing further, she went back to sleep. She awoke again after 30 minutes to the smell of smoke. Upon waking up, she discovered that the area surrounding the fuse box and phone line in the room George used as his office was ablaze. Jenny then woke up George, who in turn woke up his older son. Panic ensued as they realized the peril their family was in. Both George and Jenny and four of their children Marion, Sylvia, John, and George Jr. escaped the house, but five of their children were unaccounted for. They frantically yelled to the children upstairs, but heard no response, and they couldn't go upstairs because it was completely on fire. As the flames engulfed their home, the Sauter family encountered a perplexing series of hurdles. 
The phone was not working, prompting Marion to run approximately two and a half miles to a neighbor's house in an attempt to contact the Fayetteville Fire Department, only to find the call wouldn't connect. At the same time, a passerby who noticed the fire attempted to report it from a tavern nearby, but was equally unsuccessful in reaching an operator. In a desperate bid for help, they sought out Fire Chief F.J. Morris in person, only to be met with the startling revelation that the fire department was understaffed due to the holiday season and he was unable to operate the fire truck. It took the fire department an astounding seven hours to arrive at the scene. George, known for his resilience and determination, refused to stand by as his home and possibly his children were consumed by flames. He tried to re-enter the house but was driven back by the intense heat and smoke. He also attempted to climb the house's outside wall and broke open a window, cutting his arm in the process, but that was unsuccessful. George then remembered the ladder that was usually propped against the house, but desperation grew as they discovered that the ladder was mysteriously missing and George's attempts to start both of his trucks to reach the upper windows failed inexplicably, which was also mysterious since they had been operational just the day before. Feeling frustrated and helpless, the six solders who had escaped had no choice but to watch the house burn down completely, assuming the other five children had perished in the blaze. In the hours that followed, all that remained were the charred remains of timbers, rubble, and the basement. By the time firefighters arrived, the solder home was reduced to ashes and there was no sign of the five missing children. Following a quick inspection by the police and firefighters, they concluded that the five missing solder children had perished in the fire. Yet, not a single bone or identifiable remnant was found among the ashes, an anomaly that defied explanation and ignited the first sparks of doubt in the hearts of the solder family and their community. The aftermath of the fire left the Stoddard family with more questions than answers. The initial shock of the tragedy was soon replaced by a growing suspicion that this was no ordinary fire. The series of odd events leading up to and during the fire, such as the missing ladder, the malfunctioning trucks, and the delayed response from the fire department, suggested a sinister plot rather than a tragic accident. Eventually, they began to question all the official findings about the fire. They were not satisfied with the determinations made by local authorities due to the many unanswered questions and the unusual circumstances that occurred before and during the fire. George recalled that a stranger showed up at his house in the fall of 1945 and inquired about work relating to hauling. As he made his way to the back of the house, he said, this is going to cause a fire someday, and pointed to two different fuse boxes. This struck George as an odd remark, particularly since he had recently had the local power company inspect the wiring and declared it to be in excellent shape. Another unusual incident occurred when a life insurance salesman paid the family a visit on October 1945, a few months before the fire, and attempted to close a deal. After George told him he wasn't interested, the man told him his house would go up in smoke and his children are going to be destroyed. George was an outspoken and opinionated man who frequently made enemies due to his opposition to Italian dictator Benito Mussolini, which led to arguments with other immigrant community members and left some with hard feelings. When the salesman was confronted about the remark he made to George, the salesman said he made those remarks because of the derogatory comments George made about Mussolini and that he didn't act on them. Another cause for concern was an odd vehicle that the family had noticed multiple times before Christmas, with its occupants seemingly keeping an eye on the younger Sadokids as they made their way back from school. 
A few witnesses also came forward saying they had seen the children during and after the fire. While the house was on fire, a woman who was watching the fire from the road reported seeing the children staring out of a passing car. At a rest stop area halfway between Fayetteville and Charleston, another woman mentioned that she had given them breakfast the day after the fire and pointed out that there was a car in the parking lot of the rest area with license plates from Florida, but nothing ever came out of the sightings. Still, the Sada family held out hope. They produced flyers with photos of the kids and provided a $5,000 reward for information. They quickly increased the sum to $10,000. They installed a billboard at the house's location in 1952, as well as another one next to Anstead on U.S. Route 60. Over the years, the Sauter family pursued numerous leads. Despite each lead reaching a dead end, the family persisted in their search. In 1968, a full 23 years following the blaze, Jenny was sent an envelope with no return address, postmarked from Central City, Kentucky. Contained within was a photograph depicting a young man, and inscribed on the reverse side was, Louis Sauter, I Love Brother. Frankie Lil Boys, A90132. While officials dismissed it as a heartless prank, George and Jenny were convinced that the photograph bore an uncanny resemblance to what Lewis would have looked like growing up, considering it convincing proof that Lewis, at the very least, was still alive. Filled with hope, they hired a private detective to go to Central City, Kentucky to uncover the identity of the sender or locate the young man depicted in the photo. Unfortunately, after accepting his payment and departing West Virginia, the investigator vanished without a trace. Undeterred and still hopeful, they added the new picture to their billboard. George died the following year on August 16, 1969, at the age of 73. Following George's passing, Jenny remained in the family residence, spending her remaining years wearing all black in mourning and maintaining the garden where the house once stood. Jenny died on February 15, 1989, at the age of 85. Afterward, the family finally took the weathered, worn billboard down. The legacy of the Sauter children and the mystery that enveloped their disappearance remain etched in the annals of history, a haunting echo of a night that changed everything for a family and a community left to wonder what might have been. Thank you for joining me on this journey into the mysteries of the unexplained. Remember to subscribe, like, and hit the notification bell to stay updated on every captivating story we uncover. Until next time, keep your eyes open and your mind curious. Stay tuned for more stories from As Told by Bells.